I usually get a two-minute warning. Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to uh, another version of Jesus and Jesus. What a beautiful day here on the mountain. I tell you what, it's just gorgeous. We're glad to have you. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Pitter. This is our weekly ministry to you guys. Jesus and Jeans, worship at the cottage. And uh, we're so thankful that you join us, especially if you're joining us via the internet. Um, we are always honored that you take time, wherever you are, uh, to be uh, part of our worship. We're going to sing just a, a great old hymn today. And... Uh, we're going to just praise the Lord. Everybody ready to do some, uh, some praising? What a fellowship, what a joy to find on the everlasting God. What a blessedness, what a peace is found on the everlasting God. Change up. 
She's needed in uh, in Washington uh, as a uh, to helping with uh, the rescue uh, with uh, both Haiti and uh, and no, no, uh, immigration uh, immigration yeah. oh, with immigration. So uh, I just got a text from her. She's watching today. So oh, say hey to hey. Karen. Hey. Oh, good. Uh, I want to continue to pray for uh, Sid Penner and uh, and his family. Uh, so Jim's brother, uh, he, he went into, we prayed for last week, uh, he went in Friday for a surgery. Uh, was going to be about a 10 or 12 hour surgery. When they got in there, uh, they found uh, that his, his pancreas was doing pretty well, but they found uh, another cancer uh, in his liver. And uh, it's uh, mastitis, who uh, like stage four. And so they, they, they did remove his appendix. His appendix was about to rupture and so, uh, so now they're just kind of regrouping and, and seeing what type of treatment will be available uh, for him. I want to pr continue to pray for little Ollie. Uh, she's our, our little angel who has uh, chemo. The, she had chemo this week, still fighting uh, childhood cancer. Uh, as well as Aiden who has uh, leukemia. Our friend Scott Hancock uh, who continues to battle. Uh, our friend Tom uh, was in the hospital for three days. We didn't know that. We had uh, had cellulitis, and so we just thank God, praise God that you're with us and uh, that you're doing better. Brother Tom. Amen. Uh, Dick Malcolm, a friend of the Mathers, got a, a just a great praise report. We've been praying for his uh, issues with his heart, and uh, had a, a new heart doctor gave him. Uh, uh, a new medicine and his heart's uh, beating significantly better and got the electrical stuff I guess all uh, taken care of and so uh, uh, he's going to be uh, going home here in a few days and uh, so we're, we just praise God for that. Continue to pray for uh, my friend Belinda Jenkins. Uh, she's from my hometown and she's battling uh, brain cancer. She travels from South Carolina to Atlanta for treatments uh, on a regular basis and so we just pray for her and her family. I had another uh, praise report. I got a, a text from Bill Thomas this morning that uh, the twins, uh, uh, Miranda, his niece, had twins, and we've been praying for them for a long time, and they finally got to go home. Uh, and, uh, it's 
so they're doing well, gaining weight, and uh, just doing better. Maria Claire and Charlotte Charlie Louise. <laughs> so uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, then uh, Jan, my wife Jan's cousin, Camler, uh, he and his uh, had, he and his uh, was it wife, oh. girlfriend, they had rented a house and uh, got struck by lightning, lightning, and the house burnt down, and they lost everything <laughs> they have in the house. I mean, everything. all their computers, their clothes. I mean, you know, everything. And uh, so, uh, I want to pray for my granddaughter uh, uh, Sarah. She uh, was diagnosed uh, at, at, at school with uh, COVID, and uh, but she's doing great. Their, their whole family's uh, been vaccinated, and so uh, she's doing good, but we just want to continue to pray uh, because uh, this uh, obviously is, is still on the forefront of everything that we deal with and uh, on a daily basis, so I want to pray for them as well. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for another day. Thank you for giving us just such a, a wonderful place to come and experience you in spirit and in truth. Everywhere we look, we see your presence and your handiwork. And I'm always amazed at uh, this place that you give us to live and uh, to work and to do life together. Uh, help us to never take it for granted. We lift up every prayer request that we've mentioned today, Father. Uh, trusting and believing that you're already there. That you're already intervening in only the way that you can. So we pray for each individual, each family. And just pray, God, that your peace, your healing, uh, your comfort, your protection, your grace, your mercy. We pray uh, for the message today as we continue in our series. And as I always uh, ask, Father, each and every week, come, come, Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Fill our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out that we might be better prepared to engage the world around us, that they might see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for loving us. We pray your blessings this morning in the most powerful name, that of your son Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Well, we are uh, continuing in our series, the series that we started last week. It's entitled, A Heart Like His. And we're looking at the qualities that a Christ follower should and needs to possess Qualities that should be deep within our hearts. And if you remember, we looked last week, uh, that, that heart that we're talking about is not the muscle that beats in our chest. It's that our inner spirit, it's our inner person, who we are in spirit. That part that's created in the image and the likeness of God himself. And today we're going to be looking at a grace-filled heart. A heart that's filled with with the grace of God. But what exactly is grace? You see, that, that's a very important question because I found over 25 years in ministry that many believers don't really understand grace. God's grace is founded, the foundation of it is founded on His unmerited favor towards each one of his children. Max Lucado puts it this way. He says, grace is God's best idea. He says, his decision to ravage a people by love, to rescue passionately, and to restore justly, what rivals it? He says, of all his wonder, wondrous works, grace in my est estimation, is the magnum opus. Pastor and author Nadia Bowles Weber defines grace this way. She says, grace isn't about God creating humans and flawed beings and then acting all hurt when we inevitably fail and then stepping in like the hero to grant us grace, like saying, 
oh, it's okay, I'll, I'll be the good guy and forgive you. No. It's God saying, I love the world too much to let your sin define you and be the final word. I am a God who makes all things new. My acrostic for grace said that it used to be the old standard for the, uh, for the word grace was God riches at Christ's expense. And even though that's, that's true, my, my acrostic is God's real attitude clearly expressed. You see, there, there are two truths that I wanted to share with you this morning that everyone should know. And once we get these down, they'll, they'll transform our thinking when it comes to God's grace. First, there is nothing, nothing, not one thing, not one iota, goose egg, nothing that, can, that we can do to make God love us any more than He already does. And second, there's nothing, nothing, goose egg, nada, zip. There is nothing that we can do to make God love us any less. If you can get those down in your mind and in your heart, and especially in that inner person, it will change the way that you think about God. You see, grace is God's gift to us. It's a gift from God. Therefore, we can't earn it because no one can earn a gift. It's given to you. And what we need to do is then to receive to receive God's grace and open it up for our lives and living every, every day. And this morning, there are, there are three concepts to having a grace-filled heart that I want to share with you. The, these are hearts that, that are filled with gratitude, endurance, and a reverence for God. So let's look at these this morning. The first, a, a grace-filled heart is a grateful heart. When I think about someone in Scripture who had a grateful heart, I always think of the, the woman with the alabaster jar. She comes to my mind first. And I want you to listen to what Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 39, this is from the message translation. I, I want you to listen to what it says. It says, One of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, Ask him over for a meal. He went to the Pharisee's house and sat down at the dinner table. Just then, a woman of the village, the town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet weeping, raining tears, on his feet. Letting down her hair, she dried his feet, kissed them, and anointed them with the perfume. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man was the prophet I thought he was, he would have known what kind of woman this is who was falling all over him. You see, this woman recognized who she was. She recognized what she was. And she also recognized who Jesus was. And she shows her gratitude in the best and the highest way possible as she knelt at his feet praising and serving him by cleaning his feet with her tears and anointing them with this fragrant oil, this perfume. It was her way of saying, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for extending grace. I love you. 
It changed her life. It changed her perspective on who God was. Far different from the Pharisees' idea of who God was, who God is. You see, Jesus met her where she was in life. He knew her story. He knew who and what she was. And the same is true for each one of us. He, he knows who and what we are. He knows our story better than anyone. And He offers us grace. It is by God's grace that we're even here this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. God didn't have to wake us up this morning. He didn't have to give us another breath of life. But by His grace, He did. It, it, it's with this knowledge that, that we should then have and develop a grace-filled heart of gratitude. Another person with such a, a grace-filled heart of gratitude was a, a man by the name of John Newton. Anybody know who John Newton is? Well, he was the author of the, the hymn that we sang this morning, Amazing Grace. And God spared his life in a storm that should have sunk the ship that he was piloting. And after this experience, he became a minister of the gospel and wrote down his words of gratitude. In the verses, in verse 1 and verse 3 that we set three that we sang this morning, he says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Verse 3, it says, Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. But this grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. You see, when we develop a grace-filled heart of gratitude, it changes our lives from the inside out. And so if that's true, how should a grace-filled heart of gratitude respond? When we look at God's amazing grace, grace that we don't deserve, grace that keeps us and protects us and guides us and saves us, a grace-filled heart of gratitude responds by praising God's wonderful, marvelous, and amazing grace. Such was the heart of John Newton when he wrote this hymn. But such a, a grace-filled heart responds also through generosity. I mean, consider Jesus who gave it all. If we want a, a measuring stick to see how we stack up and are living up to God's wondrous grace, we need to consider Jesus' generosity as He died to take our place and to set us free. In Paul's letter to the Philippian church, he described it this way. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Who being in the form of God made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. When we show such generosity from a heart filled with gratitude, God will make all grace abound in our hearts. And the result is we'll have everything that we need in abundance to do what, whatever God has called us to do. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9. It says, God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always having Sufficient, all sufficiency in all things 
may have an abundance for every good work. Again, such generosity is, is just not, it's not a one-time event. It really is a lifestyle. It involves our time throughout our entire lives. It's the giving of ourselves completely, cheerfully, liberally, and abundantly. And so, the first aspect of a, a grace-filled heart is that it is a heart of gratitude. Next, we see that a grace-filled heart is also an enduring heart. It was such an enduring, grace-filled heart that John Newton wrote about in his hymn. In one of the other verses it says, The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. What we need in order to get this this end, this, this enduring heart and to have such an enduring heart comes from our, not from our confidence in ourselves, but our confidence in the Lord. Amen? You see, people today are going through so much. I mean, you don't have to watch the news for long. I mean, from the realities of the, the pandemic to the state of our nation, to a, a wide variety of illnesses and disease, to stress levels that are off the chart, many of, of whom are just one tick away from a heart attack. People suffering from cancer. Our young people turn more and more to substance abuse, using alcohol and drugs like fentanyl to mask their pain and their anguish, thinking that, that it'll bring them peace and, and relief. But they never did. James 1, verses 2 through 4, says this. It says, My friends, be glad, even if you have a lot of trouble. Now that's a strange verse, isn't it? Be glad. Be glad, even if you have a lot of trouble. You know that you learn to endure by having your faith tested. But you must learn to endure everything so that you will be completely mature and not lacking in anything. If you're going to learn to do something, it takes a lot of practice, doesn't it? It takes a lot of testing. You know, I don't, I don't just play the guitar because, you know, I, I like to... It's taken a long time to develop calluses on the end of my hand so that it makes like the guitar sounding, oh, well, that sounds easy. <laughs> it is when you got these. If you don't have those, it's going to be a painful process. You know, the Greeks had a race in their Olympic Games that was very unique. The, the winner of the race was, was not the runner who finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. Paul tells us that with God, there's no doubt about our reward through our endurance to the end. He said because that he had fought the good fight and because he had finished the race keeping faith the whole way. He said there is now a crown of righteousness waiting for him in heaven. And not only to me, he says, but to all of those who wait with love for him to appear. God gives us the power to keep on going when all we want to do is quit. He gives us the power to endure through times of trial and tribulation. And the Bible talks about how Satan is a, a roaring lion seeking whom that he may devour. You remember we studied that in 1 Peter 5.8. And in short, that means that Satan is out 
to eat our lunch. But if we stand firm in the faith, if we put on the full armor of God, as I've taught on several occasions, when we endure the hardships, then you know what happens? Satan has nothing to hold on to. He has no power. He has nothing to grab hold to to bring you down. And the reality that most often that we face as believers is the fact that we just get tired. I mean, if you sit in front of the news all day long, it will wear you out. Turn that stuff off. Get out. Breathe some air. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We just get tired. We're exhausted. And we only seem to have enough energy sometimes just to get by. And once that's expended, that's it. It's hard for us to do anything else as far as being able to minister to other people. There's Because there's nothing left in the tank. And guess what happens? We become vulnerable. We become vulnerable to attacks of the enemy. And when we're exhausted, what happens is that we find ourselves without much energy to fight the temptation or the trial that we face. And so we kind of coast in, in our spiritual walk just hoping that we have enough energy to get by. But the only time we can coast, and I want you to catch this, the only time we can coast is when we're going downhill. And if all we're doing is coasting in our spiritual life, then what will happen is that we'll find ourselves on that slippery slope of traveling down a highway to hell instead of climbing the stairway to heaven. You see what I did right there? <laughs> that was good. But that's real. That's true. Paul says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. That's Galatians 6, 9. And for this to happen, for us to have that kind of endurance, we need exactly what Jesus knew that his disciples needed. And that's Holy Spirit power. Jesus knew what lay before the disciples once he had gone back to heaven. And so he told them to wait, wait, wait in the city until they were endued with this heavenly power. Power from on high. Power to endure to the end. Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. And so when we find ourselves tired, when we find ourselves exhausted and just ready to give up, there are, there are three things that we can do that I believe will help. Things that we need the Holy Spirit's power for. The first thing is being able to submit to God. The Apostle James says, He gives more grace. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. That's James 4, 6-8. And so God will give us more grace when we submit ourselves and draw near to Him. The second thing is get God's Word inside of you. The Bible brings us comfort. It strengthens our hearts. It, it fills our spirits. It soothes our souls. It gives us the energy to keep going, to endure. And this is why that we, we need to get into God's Word and we need to let God's Word get into us. Memorize it. Use it. Again, when Satan uh, tempted Jesus in the wilderness, it was God's Word that He spoke to the enemy. I mean, 
Jesus could have said, come here. I'm going to poke you in the eye. I'm going to get you out of here. <laughs> Poof, you're out. You're gone. But he didn't. He used the word of God. It is written. The psalmist says in Psalm 119.11, Your word I have hidden in my heart, in my inner being, that I might not sin against you. And then the third thing is cling to God's promises. Lean on the everlasting arms as we sang this morning. Do you realize that there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible? 7,000 promises for you each and every day. So we, we need to keep focused on the hope and the promises of God. When, when Paul asked God to remove his illness, his malady that he was suffering from, the Lord said that he would give Paul the strength and the grace to endure it. He said in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. It, it was with such an enduring heart that Paul believed God's promises for his life. And those promises saw him through to the end. And it, it's, it's with such a, a grace-filled heart of endurance, believing in God's promises that will see us through as well. And so a, a grace-filled heart is a heart of gratitude. It's a heart that endures all of the, the slings and the arrows of outrageous fortune. And then finally, a grace-filled heart is a heart that fears God. The, this concept of, of fearing God was very real to John Newton as he wrote in the second verse that we sang this morning, to his grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. During the terrifying hours of that storm, Newton, who didn't believe in God at that point, he, he wrote this, he prayed. And John Newton said, he said, I concluded my sins were too great to be forgiven. I waited with fear and impatience to receive my doom. Newton was afraid. And later he believed that this fear was God's tool to get his attention, bringing him to salvation. Again, listen to that first line. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." Besides the love of God bringing people to salvation, the fear of God does as well. And Paul said in Philippians 2, he said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The word fear uh, that I, I want you to understand has the meaning of not being afraid of God, withdrawing from Him, it has the meaning of having an awe and a reverence for God. Does that make sense? So it's a totally different approach. And Paul tells us that if God is for us, then who can be against us? I mean, this is a, a powerful and remarkable verse. That God is, is not just with us. Emmanuel, God with us. It's not that He's just with us. He's for us. Do you ever think of yourself that way? God's for me. He loves me. He's for me. He's for my future. He's, he's for giving me a hope, as Jeremiah 29.11 says. 
For I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a, a hope and a future, not plans to harm you. And what makes this, this concept so remarkable is that there are so many reasons why he should be against the same man. I know for the little fat boy sitting here. <laughs> there are so many reasons that he should be against us, but because of his grace, he's for us. He's for us. And because of Jesus, as we sang this morning, our, our chains are gone. We've been set free. My, my God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace. Do you believe that this morning? You are set free. You see, A.W. Tozer, one of the great pastors and authors, uh, in his book called The Knowledge of the Holy, he writes this. He says, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Did you get that? He says, we, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. In other words, whatever, however you perceive God, if you feel like, as Jonathan Edwards wrote, that you're just a, a sinner in the hands of an angry God, that's the kind of believer that you're going to be. You're going to be critical. You're going to be angry. You're going to be quick to point a finger. Well, God's going to get you, but boy, if you hadn't have done that. <laughs> In Jesus' name. Which has done, been done for centuries. Every major religious war that's ever taken place is because of an angry God. And so you become what you perceive God to be. If you see God as light and love, as 1 John tells us, that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. None. And so if you see God as, as light, as hope, then, then you will have a more of a tendency to be a grace-filled Christian, a grace-filled Christ follower who is willing to be able to see through the lens of grace as opposed to anger and wrath and malice. So, the question is, what is your mental image of God? How do you see Him? How do you perceive Him? Do you see Him as up there with a lightning bolt ready to you know, strike you? Well, you, know, you were good till you did that. You know? Or a God with a piece of, of chalk and an eraser, you know. Well, you're in, you're out. You're in, you're out. Well, you lost your salvation on that one, buddy. I mean, if you hadn't have done that, you were, you were, you were that close. But I mean, you were in. But nope, you had to go do that. It's just not who God is. It's not who the God that I, I worship, that I, I, I believe fills my soul and my life, my heart. I, I, I hope and I pray that your mental image of God really is Jesus. Because that's why He came. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 from the message translation says this. Since the children, it's us, since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by His death. And by embracing death, taking it into Himself, He destroyed the devil's hold on death 
and freed all. How many is all? Not, you're just not singled out. There's not something about you that ticks God off. All. Taking death into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who cower through life. Scared to death of death. See, a, a grace-filled heart is a heart that develops an awe and a reverence for God that is unshakable. And as Solomon said, he, he says in Proverbs 9, he says, it's the fear, it's the reverence of God that brings both wisdom and knowledge. It's that reverence of God that brings both wisdom and knowledge. It's not one or the other or one without the other. It's both and. Wisdom and knowledge. I want to close with a, a story. In his, in his book, it's called The Prodigal of God. It's written by Pastor Tim Keller. He's a great author, great pastor. And he uses the, this following story to illustrate how experiencing God's grace can truly transform our life. He, he writes, the acclaimed foreign film, Three Seasons, is a series of vignettes about life in post-war Vietnam. It says one of the stories is about Hai. He's a, a cyclo driver. In other words, he, he rides a bicycle, drives a bicycle rickshaw. And a young girl named Lan, she's a beautiful prostitute. And both have deep, unfulfilled desires. Hai is in love with Lan. And Lan lives in grinding poverty and longs to live in the beautiful world where she works, but in which she never spends the night. She hopes that the money she makes by prostitution will be her means of escape, but instead the work brutalizes and enslaves her. And then high one day, he enters a, a cyclo race, a rickshaw race, and he wins the top prize. And with the money he won, he brings Lan to the hotel. He pays for the night, and he pays her fee. And then to everyone's shock, he tells her he just wants to watch her fall asleep. Instead of using his power and his wealth to have sex with her, he spends it to purchase a place for her for one night in a normal world to fulfill her desire to belong. And Lon finds such grace deeply troubling at first, thinking that that Hai has done this to control her. But when it becomes apparent that he's using his power to serve rather than use her, it begins to transform her in such a way that it made it impossible for her to return to a life of prostitution. And Keller notes that in a similar way, Christians are transformed as we accept how Christ served and died for us while we were totally unworthy of His love. And so Keller asked, why wouldn't you want to offer yourself to someone like this? Selfless love destroys mistrust in our hearts towards God. 
So a, a grace-filled heart is a, a heart that is filled with Christ. Because all of God's grace came through Him. That's what John 1.17 tells us. A grace-filled heart is filled with Christ because all of God's grace came through Him. And that fact alone should inspire us to live in God's grace. But the good news is, is that it doesn't stop there. I want you to listen to what Paul tells us in Romans. Romans 8. These are some of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. So Paul asks a question. He says, so what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing Himself to the worst by sending His own Son, is there anything else that He wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even to point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment, sticking up for us. And Paul writes, Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way, Paul says. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. And Paul says, look, they kill us in cold blood because they hate you. We're, we're sitting ducks, he says. He said they pick us off one by one. But then he goes on to say that none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. And he says, I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. Now, do you believe that this morning? That is the power of God's Word. The living Word. Jesus Christ, the Master, has embraced us. And because of that, our lives are changed. We're different. You may not feel different. You may not look different when you go look in the mirror. I know I'm not getting any prettier. I tell Jan all the time. <laughs> but I know that the Master has embraced my inner being. He's touched me in a way that's made all the difference in my life. Not that it's not perfect. You know, if you hang around me long enough, you'll see both good and evil. That's why I tell you, I'm not your role model. But our master that has embraced us, yes. And so uh, a heart that is filled with God's grace is that a, a heart that is a grateful heart. It's an enduring heart. It's a heart that possesses a healthy reverence for God, for who God is. And with that kind of grace in our inner being, again, why wouldn't we want to offer ourselves to someone like this? We have freely, we have freely received God's grace. We've been giving this amazing grace. And so my challenge to all of us this morning is to say, let's pass it on. Amen? This is a grace-filled heart. Let's pray together. 
Our Father, we, we do thank you for the power of your scripture. Thank you for inspiring the hearts of men to write down all of these wonderful guidelines and promises that gives us hope, that inspires us, that encourages us, that lifts us up, even at our lowest point. Father, help us to take these and take ownership of these scriptures and live out of your grace in our life. And then help us to pass on that same grace and that mercy to those who actually need it in this world around us. I, I pray that for us as Jesus and Jeans, that we will be a grace-filled congregation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.